You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Silver Screen Science, the first Silver Screen Science of 2022. Yeah. And one that kind of snuck up on us a little bit. We didn't expect to do this one until we saw the thing. Yes, no, we we were watching said thing and went, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we probably should talk about this. Silver Screen Science is our series where we talk about science on screen, usually in movies, although this episode we are discussing a documentary series the one that recently came out, Prehistoric Planet. A slightly different format to what we usually do here. It will be. So we're going to do the same thing that we normally do for movies. We're going to talk about the animals that are in it, right? the ancient creatures. We're going to talk about the science that's being portrayed on screen. And we're going to talk a little bit about scientists and where, you know, how they factor in. But then we are also going to have an extra little section toward the end about the series as an educational program. Yes, as a documentary. So this episode is going to focus, we're going to talk about the science, we're going to talk about the education, and if you are a patron, we will put up after this on our Patreon, as is tradition, a More Thoughts episode, which is just going to be us talking about our experience as viewers. Yeah, just how we felt while watching it. Our personal feelings. So, starting now, we always do this, it feels a little less necessary here, but just in case... Spoiler warning. Yes, we will be discussing details of the documentary. All of it. We're going to talk the whole thing, so if you want to be surprised, stop listening now. Incidentally, it is also Croc Month. Woohoo! It's June. That will be the last we talk about Crocs this episode. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, (laughs) there there are no Crocs in this documentary. All right, that's our first spoiler. There are no Crocs in the documentary. (laughs) Prehistoric Planet is a documentary series consisting of five episodes produced by BBC Studios, the same studio that brought you all of your other favorite documentaries, released on Apple TV+, and narrated by Sir David Attenborough. Yeah, the one and only. (laughs) Will, before we get into the details, would you like to give us an overview, a synopsis? Give us us the plot. Yes, exactly. (laughs) So this documentary is focused on the in Cretaceous 66 million years ago, and is a nature-style documentary a la Planet Earth, very similar to Walking with Dinosaurs and previous documentaries like that, where it is supposed to be that we are viewing these animals in their natural habitats, and we go through different ecosystems, like shores and forests and freshwater habitats. Yeah, the five episodes are specifically coasts, deserts, freshwater, ice worlds, which is Arctic environments, uh, polar environments, and forests. Then there are also uh, little bonus episodes that are uncovered, the science behind the stories. Yes. And as we go through each locale or each environment type, we look at some of the animals making their homes there and how they are surviving in those different ecosystems. And so we are moving all over and seeing different animals in these different habitats. And that's basically the concept. There is not like through line stories there's not, we're not focusing on one group of animals in each of those. We are just going to each and seeing snapshots of life from the in Cretaceous around the world. Yeah, and it is all rendered in top of the line CGI. Yeah, really, really pretty so, CGI. Again, similar to Walking with Dinosaurs, which is the docuseries that people have been most comparing this to. It's got, it kind of feels like the spiritual successor or mm-hmm. sequel to Walking with Dinosaurs. Yes. So each episode is, you know, 40 minutes of basically paleo art. Yeah. Start to finish here is just an artistic rendering of this world. And it's it's pretty awesome to see. It they, it is it is pretty spectacular. So, let us begin with our first category which is the creatures in the show. Now, normally when we would do this with Jurassic Park movies and things like that, we would just list all the different ancient animals that appear in the movie we're not going to do that this time because there are a lot of them and i don't have a list yeah we got almost five hours worth of ancient creatures yes so nah but generally speaking we get plenty of dinosaurs bunches of them we get a bunch of different kinds of theropods Uh, our big ones we get a bunch of tyrannosaurs yes so we get t-rex a couple times Mm -hmm. we get tarbosaurus we get i think it's chenjosaurus yeah 
We've got some Dromaeosaurs, including Velociraptor, who is name dropped a hand in a bunch of different episodes. Yep. We've got uh, a couple different, I think, three different sauropod species. Yeah, uh, at least Dreadnoughtus, and then a few others. We get some Ceratopsians, mm -hmm. Triceratops in the forest, and Pachyrhinosaurus in the Arctic. Uh, Ocarnotaurus, a, a theropod that I forgot, which is going to come up again because, oh, uh, I like many of the people on the internet. I really, really like the <laughs> Carnotaurus <laughs> sequence. Uh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> so we just got, we got all different kinds of dinosaurs. Uh, there are also a number of groups of dinosaurs we don't get. Yes. Uh, because, like you said, we are latest Cretaceous. Yeah, so this is very, very, very end of the Age of Dinosaurs, very end of the Mesozoic, so there's a lot of earlier species that aren't going to show up. Right, there's no Stegosaurus, there's no Dilophosaurus, there's no Allosaurus, things like that. Yes. We are also getting these animals from all over the world. Mm -hmm. So the documentary keeps hopping from place to place. North America, South America, I, I believe we're in Antarctica at one point. Yes, we are. All different continents all different places in the world which is cool because it means we are representing organisms from all over the world including a bunch of dinosaurs that have never been on screen before yes that's very true so like i think mashikasaurus might be a a first dreadnoughtus yeah. i'm i'm quite certain is a first yep. on the big screen Oh, Nanuxaurus is another one of our yes. uh, large, our, our Tyrannosaurus, which is also a first. That was one of the ones I was trying to remember the name of. Up in the up in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. uh, and we get Dinochirus, yep. which I'm sure the animators were very excited to get to animate. Uh, and Dinochirus looks like a lot of fun. Yes, absolutely. Just a big, wet moose thing. I don't know if uh, uh, Mononychus... Oh yeah, Mononychus might be a, a first on yeah, screen. I, this, I think that's the first time I've seen it animated fully like that. Yeah. So we didn't look this up ahead of time, like which ones are absolute firsts. Yes. So if we're wrong about one, forgive us. And it, and there's also some where it's not necessarily the first. Like I I think Dino Kyrus might have shown up in one of like the Curiosity streams or something. Oh, that's true. I think I saw it on there. But this is definitely the first time for a lot of them where it's been a big production. Like. Yes. Uh, BBC style and and size documentary, which is also cool in and of itself. It's like the first time you get to see one of your favorite obscure animals on a planet Earth style documentary. Yeah, and a lot of them are reconstructed in different ways than they have before. Yes. So Dino Kyrus is this. Sh it's shaggy. It, it is, is one of the few animals in the in the show that I could call shaggy. It's just got all of these uh, big furry feathers all over its body. We also get tons of pterosaurs. Yeah. I think every episode has pterosaurs in it. At yeah. least four of the five. I don't remember if Ice Worlds had pterosaurs. But we get a couple of giants. Mm -hmm. We get Quetzalcoatlus a couple times. We get Hatsigopteryx stalking through the forests. We got colonies of nesting pterosaurs or, or young pterosaurs in a couple of different parts and places mm -hmm. this this was as much a pterosaurs documentary as it was a dinosaurs documentary yeah it, it, and it that was one of the things that stood out to me was this was one of the rare documentaries i've seen where we really did emphasize pterosaurs yeah. and not just in like a every now and then to be like just a reminder the things flying in the air the big things aren't birds they're pterosaurs but like no no we're gonna spend a section really yeah. delving into them we really focus on them which is pretty awesome that's not happened very often and that is one of the many many things about this documentary that can be explained by who the main scientific consultant was <laughs> because darren nash is the main scientific consultant on this project and if you're familiar with darren nash's work and and his writings and his his research his fingerprints are all over this documentary yes this is very much a darren nash led project we also get a bunch of marine reptiles. Mm -hmm. We get a few mosasaur scenes. We get a few plesiosaur scenes. Yep, yep. And those are the main groups. We do see some other groups. We get a little bit of turtles. Yes. Uh, way at the beginning. We don't have any snakes. Nope. But we do get a lizard. Yeah, yep. So squamates uh, show up. In addition to the mosasaurs, right, we get there are there are lizard centric scenes <laughs> with the mosasaurs, but. Yeah, mostly we're not seeing a lot of other squamates. There are no crocs. Yeah. And there, there are even fish. Yeah. And that's got to make you feel a little bad. Yeah. They it, put... <laughs> it's just... it's it. 
th- there's a whole episode called Fresh Water. <laughs> yeah. And not, not, a, not, not a, a single one at the end Cretaceous. Not a croc. Now, I think that that seems to be because they were very much focused on extinct groups. Yes. Because we don't even get... I, I think there's like, there is a flock of birds in one scene briefly. Yes, exactly. Uh, an anti-ornithine birds. But even birds, I think that's the only time we see birds in the documentary. Yeah, or at least where they're mentioned. Like, there might be a couple times where they are in the scene technically right but they're not talked about so even birds did not really get a focus this was very much let's put the spotlight on totally extinct groups yes which i understand i I get the impetus sure that these are this is the only way to see these truly extinct groups is through cg like you can you can go look at a snake or a crocodile it's not going to be the extinct cousins but yeah. We do still have members of those groups. I wonder if there isn't also a point to be made that uh, the more familiar it is, the harder it is to convincingly animate. That's definitely. In CG. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder if that was a discussion that happened at one point where they went, yeah, let's not do... It's har- It's harder to get a croc to do what you want it to do than the lizard that I'm pretty sure was partially li- actual footage. Yeah. Of a lizard. Maybe we just skip trying to animate crocs. Yeah, that is... Well, it's kind of like how... CG humans still to this day mm. are very, not that they look bad even, but just very noticeable. Yeah. That your, our brains immediately go, hmm, stranger. Yes. <laughs> this is. <laughs> nope, don't like it. Slightly incorrect. We get uh, some mammals. Yes. Again, not very much focus on the mammals, but we get some. We do get some talk about plants. Yeah, yeah. There are a few scenes where we focus a bit on plants. There was one scene where we even focused on fungi for a little bit. Yeah. Which was kind of cool. We do get a, a very dynamic cameo by Beelzebufo. Oh, yeah, we, that's right. We got a frog. <laughs> I almost forgot to mention Beelzebufo. Oh, yeah. Which doing is, what it does best. That was very awesome. Stealing the show. <laughs> So, needless to say, there is a vast diversity of ancient animals depicted here. A lot of them are brand new. A lot of them, so they they are depicted looking fantastic. It's it's pretty stunning at times. Like, photorealistic. I've seen lots of people commenting online that, saying, I would occasionally forget. Yep. That I wasn't just watching video footage. Yeah, that I absolutely had that. Especially in certain shots where we'd be in like a, a shadowy forest or something where it really worked to the benefit of the CGI. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there'd be moments where I was like, how, how is, how are you doing that? How did you make this happen? It's, that's, <laughs> wow. Like we said with Dino Chirus. Dino Chirus is has not been depicted this way before, and it's very striking, and it's weird. And I like that some of the dinosaurs and some of the animals are weird. Absolutely. In this. My favorite, and I, I will talk about the pterosaurs a lot, because mm-hmm. I really like the pterosaurs. The pterosaurs looked super weird. It really emphasizes how bizarre they are. They are alien. They look... Like, if I, if I didn't know that pterosaurs were things we had in the fossil record, I'd be watching this and going, did they make those up? Yeah, right. Because they look made up. Yeah, like, how, uh, wh- why would something look like that? <laughs> yes. And I don't mean they looked weird like they did a bad job. They looked th- like pterosaurs would look, and they're just utterly bizarre animals. And I, I think they captured that really well. Well, and they captured that really well while still making them feel like living animals, like living yes. organisms. And I appreciate that because, you know, we have animals today where it's like, if go look up a video of a chameleon mm-hmm. and ask yourself, is that really That's an animal? Bizarre. It's you've got sideways hands. Yeah. Th- like you are made to only walk in the trees <laughs> and then you've got a curly Q tail and I like they feel like that. Yeah. Like a like a manta ray. Yes. Utterly true. Like it's definitely an animal. It's behaving like an animal. But I am baffled that an animal is shaped that way. Yes. And it's it's cool getting to see them focused on, you know, and just getting to see them walk around. Just lots and lots of scenes of them walking, lots yeah. of scenes of them taking off and landing and things we don't get to see. You know, very often they are background or just come into mm-hmm. a scene and leave. And so it's not often we get to just casually watch them. Yeah. I liked it. 
In most silver screen sciences, this would also be the section where we talk about how the animals are portrayed mm -hmm. in terms of their general behavior. Basically, uh, this is usually where we talk about monsterification. Yes. Have you, are these animals or are these movie creatures? And this documentary does perhaps the best job that anything has ever done on screen, certainly at this budget, depicting these ancient animals as animals. Absolutely. There is very little that feels like it, it belongs in a movie. Yeah, that's been anthropomorphized or monsterized. Yeah, there's not a lot of mindless roaring. There's not a lot of fighting. And even when there is conflict, it feels like natural conflict yeah. for the most part. Like we're fighting over a nest or we're fighting over like, like a, a co intraspecific combat for territory or for mating. Like we see the sauropods bashing into each other. Yeah. We see the dinosaurs making noises, but they're not open mouthed bellowing at nothing yes. like so often we see. Just roaring to let you know I'm a T Rex. I did like that I liked I noticed that the loudest and noisiest animals in the documentary were the herbivorous dinosaurs. Yeah. Just just trumpeting and just, bellowing. Just making all sorts of grunty, growly, roaring noises. Uh, like yep. yeah, it was very cool. <laughs> I also like the fact that e even though like the musical cues would sometimes lean that way, like yes. like some documentaries do, where it's a mosasaur has shown up, bring in the string instruments. Yep. It's time for get, Jaws music. Get low down in that pitch. And so the the music definitely leaned that way, but the animals never behaved different. Like it's not like we amped up the predatory behavior because we're about to have an exciting scene. Right. We, we're amping up the musical cues, so that's a little bit dramatic there, mm -hmm. but the animal's still behaving like an animal, and there were definitely times where they did the music to subvert your expectation. And they did that a bunch. Like th this, this documentary was definitely made with the idea in mind of, we are, not only are we not going to show you the Rory fighty uh, typical thing. That everything with sharp teeth is an action star. Yep. We're going to make you think we're about to and then not do it. Yes. Because they did that four or five times. Yes. And that I appreciated that because mm -hmm. there was, and I think this, this was uh, uh, quoted, Darren Aish said this about the sauropods of trying to subvert the stereotype of them being gentle giants. Yes. But it also felt that way with the predators that yep. uh, very often we didn't see them hunting every scene they were in. Oh, yeah. They well, weren't always killing or eating or killing attacking something the opening scene of the documentary is tyrannosaurus rex swimming which i don't think it's ever been animated at this scale doing before yeah with its babies mm -hmm. uh, to to go get its babies some food being prey yeah right the mosasaur shows up and it is the danger in the scene and then t-rex gets on to where it's going and it finds a big dead turtle and eats that yes so it just like checking down the list of all the ways <laughs> you can depict T-Rex that wouldn't be expected by most audiences. All the ways to not put T-Rex on screen. All the wrong ways. Yes, exactly. <laughs> all the stuff that Colin Trevorrow would say, no, 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 you can't do that. Yes. That's not what the audience wants. <laughs> and that was very refreshing. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very nice to, to see <laughs> mundane predators. Yeah. Like, we still have scenes of them hunting. and Absolutely. We still have, but very often they are they're treated very matter-of-factly. There's even one that's boring, because it's just a waiting game between the predator and the prey yes. as they're waiting out a blizzard. Yep. And so it's just like, oh, the predator's right there, the prey's right there, tomorrow we'll see if they hunt. Yes. Like, you know, it's just, nothing's happening, because that's, typically it's not an action scene. Yeah. And that kind of segues nicely into our science discussion of what that we understand about these animals is being put on screen. So we've got all these dinosaurs. We've got all these ancient animals. We also have invertebrates a bit. Yes. We've got a bunch of bugs and we have a, a stunning ammonite sequence. Yes, we do. Which will come up again in a little bit. Typically, when we're talking about science in uh, on the silver screen, we are discussing how scientific ideas are portrayed and how they are presented and perhaps discussed yes now in this documentary funnily enough there is actually very little discussion of science yeah they're not really going through the the scientific concepts or theories or hypotheses that are driving the documentary 
Right. The the documentary, because like you said, this is meant to be essentially planet Earth for the late Cretaceous. It's supposed to be kind of an immersion. Yes. So we are presenting information the same way David Attenborough might say. There are the cheetahs. They hunt this often. They like to hunt in the at, at dawn and dusk. Yes. And sometimes these brothers will work together and, oh, they failed the hunt, but most of the hunts fail. It's just matter of fact. Here's a bunch of information about these animals you're watching. Yes. This does that, which means that there isn't really much sign of where is this coming from? What are the hypotheses and the, the theories that explain yeah. why we put it on screen this way, where this comes from? Which bits are new and old ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, it's it's a it is presented as here's how these animals we're looking at function. Yes. And that that's that's pretty much the end of it in the documentary. The little vignettes give you a bit more. Yeah, so each episode has a bonus episode. It's like these are like four minute episodes after each one that it explores one of the ideas in the episode right yeah. could t-rex swim did dinosaurs hunt in packs and so on and that's where we see scientific discussion and where's the evidence in the fossils yes but outside of those it is david attenborough patching in from the cretaceous yes <laughs> yeah now that that being said what we're seeing on screen is built on science absolutely it is built on real scientific hypotheses and understandings of animals and understandings of dinosaurs and pterosaurs and whatnot. And so the depictions of the, the animals on screen range from stuff that we can be extremely confident in saying, this is stuff ancient animals would have done, all the way down to stuff that is kind of made up. Yeah. Like, plausible. Highly speculative. But highly speculative. And we, I've seen, we've actually received a few comments from people saying that they had a hard time telling which behaviors are based directly on fossil evidence and which ones are a bit more speculative. Yep. Now, we can't go down the whole list here. No. But we can give a few examples. So there are a bunch, there's actually a bunch of stuff in the documentary that is basically just recreated from modern nature documentaries with dinosaurs. Yes. And these are often things that's like, yes, here here is a watering hole. Water pools occasionally in the desert and it attracts animals from miles and miles around. Here that is with dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And that is that is very sound. Like, yeah, that almost certainly would have happened. Yeah, that's something big vertebrates have probably been doing since we've had big vertebrates. Yeah. That scene also includes one of my favorite <laughs> shots in the whole documentary, which is when the Tarbosaur... It's one of those subverted expectation moments when the Tarbosaurus shows up to the watering hole and David Attenborough goes, oh, all this herbivores have attracted attention. And then the Tarbosaurus walks up and gets a drink. Yeah. And then there's this shot of all the other animals have given it a wide berth <laughs> while it goes down to get a drink, which I've seen in documentaries. I've seen lions doing that on uh, out in Africa while all the other herbivores are kind of have moved a little bit off to the side. Yes. Just to not be too close to the predator. Absolutely. We also get the, the mountain hunting scene with the velociraptors. Yeah, they're hunting on the cliffs. Mm-hmm. They're going after pterosaurs. And it is extremely reminiscent of the snow leopards. Right. Hunting prey up in the mountains and a vertical chase. Yes, and happening. a drop. Mm-hmm. And so it's, those moments are very cool. And it's really nice how dynamic they feel. Like they they feel like watching mm -hmm. a, a, a realistic scene. And yes, these are behaviors that do we know this specific dinosaur did it with this specific prey or this specific right. habitat? No, but these behaviors are almost certain. These were definitely happening. Right. Well, throughout we, the the Mesozoic and Cretaceous. Right. We get the sauropods moving through the forest and knocking over trees, yep. which yeah, that is a that is pretty sound hypothesizing. We've got dinosaurs moving in herds, which we know they did. Yes. We've got dinosaurs being portrayed in various parts of the world, which of course we have fossil evidence yep. from various parts of the world. We also get things like the group nesting pterosaurs. Yes. Which we have some decent evidence for and solid evidence for. And then, of course, there are the discussions in the bonus content about, yeah, we have evidence of swimming theropods. 
from their traces, also biomechanical studies. Yeah. That we, we know large theropods, at least for the most part, would have been able to swim, and some did swim. Yes. There are also a number of things that seem to be based on at least one study. Yes. So someone on our Discord server actually shared a paper that reported charcoal within the gut contents of an ankylosaur. There you go, yep. Suggesting it was feeding in a recently burned section of forest, which we see in the documentary. An anchi- now, they, this ankylosaur takes, like, a bite out of a chunk of burned wood. Yes. And I don't know if that's what the study found. Mm-hmm. Or, or if it was that it was collecting charcoal with its food. But at the very least, it's based on the idea of herbivores feeding in burnt forests. And they, they suggest in the documentary that it was potentially using the charcoal to neutralize toxins mm-hmm. from its, its planty diet, uh, which is something we see herbivores doing. I don't know... I, I personally don't know if there's an example of charcoal, but we right. see multiple herbivores that do find antidote sources for plant toxins, either clays or some other uh, neutralizing agent to uh, balance out their diet so that they're not having to process yes. quite so toxic uh, bellyful. So there's a bunch of stuff in the documentary that are very reasonable hypotheses. Yes. So like... The velociraptors using their feathers to help with jumping and, and falling. Yeah. That has been supported by studies in modern birds that will use their wings to kind of help guide big jumps or climbing. Yeah, that you use them for man- maneuvering other than flight. Yeah, so we don't know those behaviors, but that's a that's a reasonable hypothesis. It's one of those where it is quite likely that some feathered dinosaurs was using its feathers that way considering how many birds we see using their feathers that way. Yes. Was it this specific one? That's that's much more difficult. <laughs> but right. it, this is reasonable behavior. Then there's a lot of stuff that is more speculative. Yes. So when we say speculative in this case, what we mean is that it is based on science. It is based on animal behavior. These are reasonable things for an animal to do. Yes, we're using the same logic we'd use while studying these scientific concepts. But they aren't directly supported by evidence. This is more, this is possible, wouldn't it be cool if this? Yeah, it's something that could happen and make sense. Mm-hmm. Like, there's the logic is sound, but we don't actually have some, uh, direct evidence that it was the case. So, for example, the plesiosaurs are very often depicted as very very dolphin-esque. Yeah, and their movements and they're, stuff. They're moving in a group. They uh, the, the, the one that sticks out to me is the scene where they're mobbing the mosasaur yep. to protect the other plesiosaur, which is a thing that dolphins do. Absolutely. They will mob a predator to try to uh, scare it away and protect themselves. We, there's I, I, I don't know of any evidence we have that plesiosaurs did that. Yeah, that they were that social. Yeah, you know, that they were that complexly gregarious. Yes. So this is a very common thing in, in paleontology, especially in paleo art, to go, here's a thing a modern animal does. Here is this ancient animal reconstructed doing it. We don't know that they did, but it is cool to think about. It is entirely possible. Yes. Well, and very much like in our speculative evolution episode, that's part of the drive and, and the goal of the the speculative art is to just get the idea and say, have we ever considered mm-hmm. that this animal could be behaving more similarly to this animal? We traditionally display it one way. Right. Here are other ways we could be displaying it just to kind of open up the thought process. Yes. And then there's a bunch of that also with the appearance of the dinosaurs. Absolutely. So we see stripes on the forest-dwelling tyrannosaur, which is pretty cool and based on the fact that a lot of animals in those kind of ecosystems have stripes today. Mm -hmm. We see a variety of feathers. Yep. Dinochirus is highly feathered, which is supported by evidence. And then our big tyrannosaurs are much less feathered. Nanuxaurus is more feathered. T-Rex and Tarbosaurus have very little feathering. We've talked about that on the, the podcast before, where opinions sway on yes. how much feathery covering the big carnivorous theropods may have had. Yep. And, and since it is T-Rex related, it is highly debated. Yes, there are <laughs> fistfights about it. 
There are a few really standout speculative scenes. That are, that are a bit more speculative than others. Uh, and the ones that have gotten a lot of attention. Yes. So probably the one that I see talked about the most is the air sacs on the Dreadnoughtus. Mm-hmm. So Dreadnoughtus is reconstructed with this these rows of inflatable air sacs down the neck. Little ballooning pouches that can be pumped and they bubble out of the skin. Yep, and they go whoop. This is based on the fact that a lot of animals today have stuff like that. Yeah. There are birds and frogs that do things like that. The fact that sauropod necks were full of hollow spaces and air sacs, which could have extended into something like this. Yes. And the fact that they have a lot of neck and it has been hypothesized that maybe they were using their neck for display one way or the other. That it wasn't just to reach tall trees, but there was a behavioral aspect for mating or territory or whatever right all that said we have no evidence that they had inflatable air sacs like that no that is very speculative plausible but speculative yes and so that falls in that category of almost certainly sauropod there were sauropods that had some weird displays Mm -hmm. just because there was a bunch of sauropods and they were diverse and successful and whenever you're diverse and successful there's going to be weirdos yes Here is an example of what one of those displays might have potentially looked like. Yes. But do we know they had those displays? No. Right. And do we know that's what the display would have looked like? No. No. And so that's one of those where it's not that this is unreasonable or unrealistic, but it is a very specific form of a very, very speculative idea. Yes. We also get pterosaurs nesting in male organized sort of harems Mm -hmm. where you've got a lot of females with a big male like an elephant seal yep who's running the show and they also show sneaky males which look like females to avoid competition with the big males and they can sneak in and mate with the females but without having to get into a fight yes which is a thing animals do today yep we see it in elephant seals elephant seals (laughs) do that this is another one of those where that is perfectly plausible, but there's no actual evidence that pterosaurs did that. Yes. Or indeed that any ancient animal did that. Yeah. That would be a very difficult thing for us to confirm because it's already quite tricky to tell male from female. Yes. Let alone a female portraying male. Right. So it makes sense, but we don't actually have... Uh, direct evidence that that was happening there's a number of things in this documentary that are like here's this cool obscure fact about modern animals let's make some dinosaurs do it yes or let's make some ancient animals do it we get glowing ammonites yeah the bioluminescing ammonites which again that is a thing that some modern cephalopods do squids will gather in these big glowing groups yep but again we don't know that ammonites could do that yes And it's like, that's one where I don't even know how we would tell that. Like, if we had a fossil of a firefly squid, I don't know, would it even preserve the stuff that would tell us that it was glowing? Right. Like, even though we know that species glows and we would know what to look for, would we be able to find that? Because that is very, very soft tissue. It is bacteria that's doing that job. So that's one that it might even be impossible to know that. Yes. And then the other one that I think has been getting a ton of attention is the Carnotaurus scene. Yeah. So where we have Carnotaurus, basically Carnotaurus being a bird of paradise. Yes. And it clears out a little stage, which is a thing that certain birds will do. And then it does a little dance for the, for a female. And then he's got his little tiny arms that are blue and he uses them to do a little display dance. Yeah. Which is A, speculative. Yes. And that is explained, is discussed in the little bonus episode they do go over that the idea behind this concept yes those bonus uh content by the way everybody are on youtube for free yes so you can find those on the apple tv plus youtube channel you don't have to get an apple tv plus subscription to watch those so that is highly speculative it is also straight out of all yesterdays yes (laughs) so we have talked about all yesterdays on the podcast before which is a book of highly speculative paleo art put together in large part by darren nash and in many ways, Prehistoric Planet is all yesterday's the TV show. Yep. There's a lot of that kind of thing here where it's here is a potential explanation for some of these features or here's a potential thing that doesn't fit the features we see, but is consistent with what we see in some modern animals. Yes. 
and I, I saw a post that also made the note that uh, plesiosaurs displaying with their necks out of the water. Yes, uh, where they they, they do like the uh, what do they call that when whales do it? Something spotting. Yeah, spy hopping is or spy hopping. Maybe that's yeah, it. Because that, that's what they call it when sharks do that. When great whites will do that. Right, right, spy right. Hopping. That is also straight out of all yesterdays. Mm-hmm. Which again, here is a thing some modern animals do. There is nothing in the fossils that say they did this, but they sure could have. Yes. Here's art about that. And it's another one of those where not only does this make sense that they could do it, but it does partially answer why they have such ridiculously long necks. Yes, potentially. It is a very good example of speculative evolution in that not only is it making sense, like we have not bent science to allow us to have an idea that... Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe technically, but it's solidly within right. scientific reality. Of, They're not punching through walls yes. and, you know, doing things that animals couldn't or wouldn't do. And it is something that gives the potential to answer questions we have and fit explanation. You know, it's a fitting explanation for features of an animal. Yes. So they're very good examples of speculative evolution. That these, Absolutely. These things are are completely reasonable that... Absolutely, these kinds of animals could be doing these kinds of things. And not only that, it would make sense for them to be doing these kinds of things. But it's because it is speculative, it lacks that actual evidence. Yes. That we, to give us an idea that this was definitely actually happening. And obviously there's tons more we could talk about. Oh, yes. Uh, But we aren't here to go through every single example because this recording would go on forever. Yep. Uh, but before we do move on, I would like to posit this question to you, Will. What what were your favorite parts? Ooh, yeah. Were there were there scenes or things or depictions that you really liked? Absolutely. One of the things I really did like was that a lot of the uh, vocalizations for the dinosaurs were very interesting. Specifically, I liked how many of the big theropods did closed mouth vocalizations yeah where they were would resonate with their chest i love the carnotaurus does yeah. that as like a big call towards mates yeah and it's very croc like it's extremely crocodilian and we know lots of birds do this as well mm-hmm. so like i like getting to see a depiction of t-rex making noise without opening its mouth at all yeah that's that's that was very satisfying yeah. that was cool i really liked the the scene in the desert where you had the flies and the lizard and the velociraptors and the tarbosaurs and the pterosaurs gathered around the carcass. Yes. And it was it was a stunning depiction of a little isolated food web. Yes. And it was a it was just a really cool just that scene I thought was really straight off of a desert or a the the, the plains today. That was a, such a really nice little nature moment. Well, it felt like a very complete showing of the scene there is one more note i just now remembered i i also very much liked the carnotaurus blue arm display loved the car that might be my favorite part of the whole i'm on i'm on record Mm -hmm. on this podcast saying that it is my firm headcanon that dinosaurs would have done silly dances and showy displays and made goofy noises i it was it made me very happy to see a dinosaur especially a big scary one yes being an utter goofball the way that birds are utter goofballs today it also made me very happy just personally because in our t-rex episode our tyrannosaurs episode i believe episode 120 i i came up with just a random idea of when we were talking about their little arms that maybe they were like those were feathered or displayed and oh, used yeah. to like do a little itty bitty fan dance, and yep. that's why they still had them. <laughs> I hadn't read all of yesterday's when I came up with that idea. Ah. So when this showed Carnotaurus doing it, I was like, "Yeah, me yeah. too." Those little those little wiggly arms. That, My but, favorite part is when he turns his head to both sides. Yes, and yep. he's got that. It, it, and it's a very theater kid moment <laughs> <laughs> for this Carnotaurus. I also really love, I loved the large pterosaurs. Oh, yeah. The, every time Quetzalcoatlus was on screen, I was extremely happy. Yep. Soaring majestically over the river, walking through the, all the pterosaur stuff made me extremely happy. Yes. No, they, they were very, very cool. So that's a bunch about science, the way we're depicting the animals, the hypotheses. Scientists, a common theme in our silver screen science episodes, usually we're talking about 
how are scientists being portrayed fictionally? Yeah, how, how are they showing their fake scientists played by yes. famous actors? This documentary series has real scientists. There are several scientists. We've got, oh man, can I remember all of them? Uh, Darren Nash, Liz Martin Silverstone, uh, Susie Maidman, Paul Barrett, and John Hutchinson. And I think that's all of them. If I'm forgetting somebody, my deepest apologies to that person. Yes. Of the ones that we actually get to see talking. Yes, and the talking head thing. There's a bunch listed in the credits mm-hmm. as consultants for each episode, but we don't see them. Those are just names later on in the credits. Yep. So we do get to see a bunch of scientists on screen, and they are all acting like scientists. Yep. They, they are real scientists. <laughs> so that's cool to get to see. It's cool to get to see the scientists but also, that's kind of standard for a documentary. Yes. Like, if this was a movie, it'd be like, whoa, this, this is incredible. But yeah. no, th- this is a documentary. You did the documentary thing. It is worth noting that the, t- the scientists that we do see are a very limited demographic of scientists, especially considering that the documentary series shows us fossil animals from all over the world. Yeah. All the scientists we see, if I'm not mistaken, are from the UK. Yeah, that's what it seems like. So and, and if I remember like where they are from, I'm pretty sure all those people who I have read about outside of the documentary are from the UK or at least work in the UK. So it is a little bit disappointing in terms of just representing the global community of scientists that it kind of seems like they just went down the street yeah. <laughs> from the studios to collect up all the scientists they were going to put on screen. Yeah, a little bit, especially since we do emphasize so many different localities in the mm-hmm. documentary. Like, we're in Africa multiple times, we're in Asia multiple times. Right. Well, it does the planet Earth thing. It is a prehistoric planet. Yes. We are, we are meant to. Here is the entire scope of the planet for the animals, but not so much for the scientists. Yeah. And this isn't, you know, at all disparaging the scientists who were portrayed. No, you know? no. They did a great job. Yes. And they are, they are, paleontologists in their own right and everything but sure it, yeah it would have been a little nice to especially to have seen some of the paleontologists who work in those parts of the world mm-hmm. since a lot of the paleontologists that showed up were specialists in whatever animal was being dis- dis- discussed in that right that vignette uh, it would have been also cool if we had gotten someone who worked on the african dinosaurs that we just saw this episode yeah that, that would have been nice. The scientists also only show up in those little bonus episodes. Yes. So we get a couple of sentences from each scientist within these little four or five minute bonus clips. And that's because the main episodes are meant to be planet Earth style. Right. We're not talking to scientists. We're not bringing in scientists to explain what we're seeing. We are just looking at nature footage. Yeah, you see David Attenborough at the beginning of each episode, and then it's just his voice. He yep. never walks into see, he never walks into shot or anything. And he shows up for the intro, yes. not like the beginning of what we're talking about in the episode. Just the the opening sequence for the whole series. Yeah, exactly. And then he shows up at the end to say to learn about the science behind the stories. Visit the Apple TV Plus show page yeah which is yep. so weird to hear david attenborough say the words apple tv plus yeah that was very <laughs> it's a little it's a little surreal yeah yep that was that was weird uh, you've survived into the future <laughs> sir david and it's it's a it's a dark place uh so yeah for f- compared to most documentaries this series is extremely light on scientists yes which, uh, which I understand for the aesthetic they were going for, you know, trying to make it feel like an immersive planet Earth style thing. Right. You know, they were actively avoiding talking heads. Yes. You know, that that was the opposite of what they were going for. So I get it from that point, but it, it definitely makes it a bit more notable that we only get five minutes. Yeah. With the actual experts and uh, actual researchers. Yeah. And, so, and that ties into what we said about science discussion. That's also really the only place we get science discussion. Yes. In the entirety of the show where we're talking about the research and the evidence and the fossils and all that. It was like, that's the only place where we get a picture of a fossil at yes. any point. And like clips of modern animals doing the things that we showed them doing in the, the dinosaurs doing in the documentary. And so, yeah, it's, it's limited to those extra bits. Yep. 
And that itself is a nice segue into our extra discussion section, which we don't typically do for movies because movies are not meant to be educational. This is. Yes. And since we are scientists and educators on a science education podcast, we figured we'd talk a little bit about what do we think of the documentary as an educational resource. Yeah. Now, uh, we've already talked about this. Yeah. At length. While we were watching it, we had a lot of discussions. So we both know that we we have both positive and critical things to say. Yes, we do. On the positive side, the documentary, I think it sets out above most else to depict dinosaurs and ancient animals in a way that is new and surprising and fascinating and bound to get people thinking and asking questions about these animals. While still making them feel like natural normal animals yes without engrandizing them and 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 you know blowing them out of perspective and i think it does that very well extremely no this is a very gripping documentary it is it gets your attention and it holds it this uh, this documentary will and has i've been on the internet i've seen it happening spurred lots of discussions Mm -hmm. i've seen lots of people online saying oh you know my students and i were talking about it or i watched it with my grandparents or my parents and we talked about these topics so i think as a series that presents depictions of ancient animals as well as hypotheses of ancient life it is a rich resource for those kinds of inspirational content experiential content conversations starting (laughs) this documentary series is very good at conversations starting yes absolutely one i i one of the things i kept thinking while watching it is i as a small child used to watch walking with dinosaurs just on repeat like i remember there was a time where that's the thing i'd bring with me when we went on family trips where yeah we'd go on family trips and i would have the vhs's of walking with dinosaurs with me just in my bag and then when we'd have a moment where it's like, all right, we're going to be in the hotel room for, you know, or we're going to be at grandmother and granddad's for today. We're not doing the fun stuff till the afternoon. I go, cool. And I put it into the TV and I'd color <laughs> into the or VHS, something. VHS, I bet. Yep. In the, v- the VCR, I mean. Yeah. I've already forgotten what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> and the tape player. Yep. <laughs> On the record player. And you just put it around. And, and then I'd, I'd just have it playing. So like I used to watch that just nonstop because it, it, it grabbed my imagination in my mind so thoroughly and it was so intriguing and and, and inspiring and i can definitely see kids doing that with this series i I did that a little bit with this series we watched it together and then i went back and i was like i want to see this scene again and this scene again because these are really cool and i do think that it will be very very good for in inspiring you know many new interested people to get a cool scientific look at dinosaurs yes. instead of just a Hollywood look. And it is not a coincidence, I'm sure, or at least it is It is not being lamented by anybody, that this came out right before the next Jurassic World movie Yep, is slated to come out uh, later this month. Now, I don't know that most of the audience is going to see these and say, okay, those are the real dinosaurs and those are the made-up Hollywood dinosaurs. Yeah. But at the very least, this is putting multiple images of what dinosaurs could be out into the world. It means that the the image of a velociraptor that people have seen on their TV is not just the Jurassic Park velociraptor. Yeah, it's not going to be just blue. <laughs> it's because yes. we have some scientifically backed velociraptors. Yes. And so a lot of what we see in Prehistoric Planet is speculative. Mm-hmm. Like we said, a lot of it is not largely evidence-based right indirectly oftentimes uh, at, at best but it is portraying a variety of hypotheses of how dinosaurs and other ancient animals might have been which diversifies the landscape of what is in people's brains when they think about these ancient animals yeah well it it, it is a much more dynamic experience mm-hmm. of dinosaurs than just the 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 typical movie version where it's most ones with sharp teeth act the same right and most ones without sharp teeth act pretty much the same and they're just different shapes yes and i also think that this documentary offers a whole list of 
clips that I can see being used to supplement education in classrooms or in museums. Like, if I ever give a presentation about why did dinosaurs who didn't fly have feathers, like, yeah. what could they have been using feathers for? I will be very tempted to bring up the scene of the raptors, velociraptors hunting on the cliffs yep. and using them for jumping, or the scene of Nanuxaurus up in the Arctic going after Pachyrhinosaurus and with their feathers to protect them from the cold. So I think there's a lot of potential there as well. Yes. Uh, here are really exciting, gripping depictions of some of the things that are common discussions in paleontology. Well, and like you said, if people are reusing the scenes, they'll be really good for saying, all right, here's this. Let's talk about it. Like, mm -hmm. let's talk about why it showed that way, but also, you know, let's have a discussion. Yeah. And it is, a lot of them are very good for that. You know, very, very prepped to be used that way. And it's also nice that we now have a good paleontology documentary that's recent and up-to-date mm -hmm. and shows some more up-to-date ideas. Now, on the other hand, uh, Will and I have discussed being a bit disappointed at how little scientific discussion there is in the documentary series. Yes. Especially given how much that's in it is speculative or is based on a particular hypothesis. That there's nothing wrong with speculating and showing speculative behaviors or speculative lifestyles. Any paleontology documentary that is trying to depict ancient life is going to have to do some speculation. Absolutely. Like, that, that's just part of the game. You, you can't avoid that while trying to portray extinct life unless it's something we went extinct after we had video cameras. Right. <laughs> but it also feels like there's a lot of potential for discussing the evidence and the science behind that and the hypotheses behind that and where these ideas come from that is really relegated to about 15 total minutes of TV time during those little bonus segments, which aren't even in the main episodes. You have to go looking for those. Yes. And and that really is the, the kicker in that while it is very interesting to see new and unique ideas portrayed for these animals it can be as we mentioned since we've had people who've asked us this mm -hmm. quite confusing yes. to tell all right but is there a fossil of that right because you know like they're, they're trying to do the planet earth style but when you're watching planet earth you're watching video footage yes but here no one is under the impression that this isn't made up yeah everything you see on screen is made up we it's scientifically to. informed, but this is this is a an extremely impressive piece of paleontology fan fiction. Well, it's it's like when the the new live action Lion King came out and everyone was like, "No, it's not." Right. <laughs> this is another <laughs> animated Lion King that's just meant to look real. Right. Like the background's live action. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> None of the action is live because it's all CG. Yes. Same thing here. Like it is realistic. Mm -hmm. And it is reasonable, but it is all fabricated because none of these things exist for us to film. And it's being presented very matter-of-factly. This is how this animal acts. This T-Rex has this many babies, and this many will make it to adulthood. Yeah. And these animals do this. And if he, I, my, my overall impression, my big concern, my biggest criticism of the series is summed up and uh, the, this thought that I had, I think, during after the first episode, which is that it seems like this is a series that is going to have a lot of its audience asking, how do they know that? Yeah. Without providing really any avenue to find an answer to that question. Yes. And it's also, there is a concern that a lot of the more gripping scenes like Dreadnoughtus and its air sacs. Right. Uh are going to have the, the Dilophosaurus frill issue of yes. people are now going to be like, why didn't you put air sacs on your sauropod? Right. Well, well, it, it does. I, I do think that we are going, we are looking at several years now of if you're at a museum or if you're in a classroom and you mention ammonites, for example, someone's going to go, oh, the, the ones that glow. Yep. And it's like, all right, well, well, no, they don't glow. As far as we, we really know, yeah. that is a speculative idea. And and even if some did, 
almost certainly the vast majority didn't. Right. Like that 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 is not a statement about ammonites. Right. That is a statement maybe about some ammonites potentially hypothetically. <laughs> now it is worth pointing out that if you are in a classroom or in a museum and that comes up, that's a conversation starter. And yep. now as an educator, you are able to go, oh, you know what? Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that as a hypothesis and how we interpret evidence and how, you know, where we hypothesize about ancient things. But on the other hand, that only happens if that person with that idea in their head goes to the museum yep. or brings it up in the classroom. Those are already going to be people in situations or who are already more interested mm -hmm. and are going to want to pursue it. For a lot of the people just watching at home, you know, they, they may never get to talk to a person who has the information to actually answer those questions. Right. And so I, I do wonder if the same way that the Dilophosaurus from Jurassic Park, which the idea was, could it, uh, during the, the, the creation of this dinosaur for that movie, the idea was, wouldn't it be interesting if there were features we didn't find evidence of in the fossil record? Here's an idea of what that could be, right? Yes. Spitting venom and having a frill, which again, plausible from an animal standpoint. And Those are things real animals have. A super interesting thought experiment. Absolutely. But then it went into the one of the biggest movies of all time, and that has just been what Dilophosaurus looks like in popular media for 20 years. Yeah. Well, and, and it wasn't said as, could there be features that didn't fossilize? We found out there were features that didn't fossilize. Right. And here it is. It's just, here is this animal. And and though it is not the same degree, mm -hmm. that is technically what this documentary is doing. Right. That so is are, are, how they're presenting it. Are we going to see several years of just, that's what sauropods look like, is that they have these these balloons. Because this one documentary series thought it would be interesting to put that on screen. Yeah. And I understand that a big part of that reasoning was to maintain the immersion yes. of this planet Earth style documentary. Yeah. We're not talking about this. There's no humans here. We are just describing the natural ecosystem. Yeah, they, they weren't even most of the times talking about the dinosaurs in past tense. No. They were talking about them as if we're seeing them in front of us in real time. Yeah, at the beginning of the each episode, he says, Earth 66 million years ago. And then that is the end of the acknowledgement that this isn't happening in the present day. Exactly. And and I've seen lots of people who have commented liking that specifically. Yes. Well, and they like that there's no talking heads mm -hmm. interrupting what I want to watch, which is just dinosaurs on screen. And so it's not that there's not a logic behind sure. choosing not to do this, but it does mean that you lose some of that clarity and you lose some of that scientific transparency to where... It, you're going to have, and we've had people say, some of this seems real fake. Like, mm -hmm. and I can't, but I can't tell which is which. And right. that that is not going to help the issue of people who already question the validity of what scientists tell them. Yes. So that's a concern. Yeah. And, and I, I know that, you know, what you put on the screen is always going to override the text. Absolutely. The, the, the words. So the fa you put glowing ammonites on the screen, you put dancing carnotaurus. That is, it doesn't matter how many words you say that say this is speculative, this is an idea. People are going to remember that. It's going to show up in art. It's going to show Absolutely. up elsewhere. Like for many people, explaining it would not change their experience of the documentary. Sure. But it feels like there was plenty of opportunity here. To, even if you didn't want to have talking heads coming in and saying, well, I, you know, here's the evidence, here's the fossils. To at least have David Attenborough say, this is speculative, this is based on these ideas that yep. we see in modern animals. I would have loved for, for him every now and then to go, in modern oceans, dolphins will work together to mob and scare away a predator. Perhaps plesiosaurs did something similar. Yes. Here they are doing something similar. Yeah. Here we have reconstructed them doing something similar. And I know that for the seven-year-olds watching it, that's probably not going to make a difference. They're just going to go, oh, yeah, plesiosaurs are fighting together off the mosasaur. Yeah, and for lots of adults as well that are just going to... Sure. They're, they're not... They're enjoying the visuals more than they are the words being said. But for those who have posted saying, I'm confused. Right. It would have alleviated all of their confusion. 
it it does i like you you mentioned the word transparency it is missing some transparency yes. it is 40 minutes of an authoritative voice saying here is how it is we know these things you know no all capitals we know these things right about dinosaurs and that's not really the case and that's not to say that this is you know that we have to debunk this documentary yes but it does mean that as time goes on and this comes up especially in educational settings scientists and educators will have to have that talk about okay that that actually is a hypothesis yeah we don't know this for sure and that's that's a, got both sides where on the one hand, that's great because then you get to talk about hypotheses and what we know and what it's based on. And that that can spur an entire great scientific science discussion. But on the other hand, it does mean at least a little bit that we have to say, all right, that incredibly well done documentary from a highly respected educational studio delivered by a highly respected educational voice put together by scientists from all over the world made some stuff up yeah it's it's basically my feeling on it is kind of that yes those questions will spur conversation and start discussions Mm -hmm. but those questions are happening because of confusion that is valid yes like that's valid confusion because you did not explain it and even if you had explained it we still would have gotten people asking those questions because they either didn't pay attention while they were watching and missed it, sure. or they weren't. They didn't believe it when it was said, and we're like, "Get away for real, though." Right. For real. Right. <laughs> that makes sense, and we can go. Okay, we don't know for sure, but yes, actually, that here are all the reasons. Then we could have backed the documentary up. Right. And come to its defense on why that speculation is actually quite reasonable. No, we don't know for sure, but here's why they put it in. Here's all the cool ideas. Instead of saying, okay, yes, your confusion is valid and and uh, slight apologies. It's a cool idea. Here's the reasoning. But no, we don't. Right. It, we could have been allying instead of somewhat correcting course. So, and I think that this... Uh, issue to the extent that it is an issue and we think that it is at least somewhat of an issue as educators it's it's an issue it's an issue that we're gonna have to deal with (laughs) (laughs) well it's funny because i've i've heard from a lot of different people about this documentary and i think so far all of the people whom i've heard these concerns voiced by by are museum educators yep the people who work in museums and interact with museum audiences who have this exact concern yep that People, uh, one of the people I heard from compared it to the Discovery Channel Megalodon documentary. Mm-hmm. Well, and it, now that is a completely unfair comparison. Yes, that is in most <laughs> regards an extreme. That was version. a that was evil. <laughs> that was the worst way <laughs> you could do one of these kind of educational documentaries. But to the point of a respected source putting out information that we maybe have to kind of correct. Uh, now, that said, uh, we said all those wonderful things about it early on. I do think, and I know Will agrees because uh, we've talked about it, that this is a positive force. Yeah, on the whole, I do think it will do more good than bad. Absolutely. This isn't like, you know, when we talk about Jurassic Park or Jurassic World and we're like, well, is it worth, yes. are the positives worth the negatives? And and in, in many of those cases, the scale is very, very even, if not greatly tipping toward yes. the negative <laughs> in this case i don't think that's a concern this is a great educational resource but yeah i think that these are critiques that are worth discussing especially if they're going to do more of it yeah uh, which it sounds like everybody wants them to do more of it i agree i would also love for them to do more of it yep i think that the biggest thing that holds them back is probably that planet earth style of presenting it very directly and very matter-of-factly, that really does rob you of the opportunity. Like I said, I get why you don't want to have scientists popping up and interrupting your dinosaur scenes. Absolutely. But at the very least of acknowledging in the script that this is speculative or what is the evidence that this is based on, here is a scene that seems unbelievable to the general audience, you know, who the average viewer which is actually based on completely solid scientific evidence. And here's a scene that seems totally unbelievable, which 
is less so, and it is more speculative. And you can say that in the script, but you can't say that in the script if you're trying to maintain the facade of Cretaceous planet Earth. Yeah, the the illusion that you're setting up. And then that the real question is just, is that immersion and that illusion and that aesthetic worth the lack of clarity? Right. Uh, and to some it is. I, I've seen many oh, people yeah. who have said specifically that. I'm glad they didn't yes. explain because I don't want to, I didn't want them to break my immersion while mm-hmm. watching it. So for some people it is, that is specifically what how they would have preferred it to be. Yes. And I've spoken to people who say, no, no, I, I like this better. Mm-hmm. Let's not do that different take. Yeah. So it it's not that this is a definite, absolute flaw, but from the perspective of an educator, mm-hmm. it is a complication and an issue in how it is going to be perpetuated and received by the general public. Yeah, th- there is also something to be said, and I've seen this comment made as well, for the trend of scientific information just being presented and expected to be accepted. Yeah, just saying, this is true. Here are how. Here is how it is, and not really providing much backup or, or any explanation of why that is the case. Yeah, why you should trust... <laughs> What's being yeah. said. And in this case, it's you should trust this because David Attenborough is saying it. Yep. Uh, which makes it even that much a little bit more disappointing yeah. that there isn't that transparency. Because I'm like, oh, David Attenborough. Yeah. I, I've seen you do do this before. Yeah. I well, know you can do it. <laughs> th- this kind of, we've done documentaries where we haven't had any talking heads and yet still are explaining the science behind the animal behavior we're watching. Mm-hmm. So like, it doesn't have to be... 100% one or the other. But I I understand why they did it this way even though even if I don't necessarily agree. Yes. Now all that being said, we know that there are tons of varying opinions about this documentary series. We really liked it and we hope they do more uh similar in the future. Please let us know what you thought. Absolutely. You know, on the social medias, on our Discord server, all the links that are down in the episode description. Have a conversation, get into the discussion and chit chat with us and with our other listeners about what you thought of the documentary and its strength and its weaknesses and and the like. Yeah. Do you have favorite scenes? Do you have favorite moments? Are there things that you felt, you know, that you noticed that uh, took you out of it or felt more problematic than what we've mentioned? Yes. And of course, it's worth noting again, we could talk more about this forever. Yes. <laughs> but we're going to stop our science discussion here with one little last piece at the end of the episode. We have a tradition in Silver Screen Science because the point of Silver Screen Science, as we say at the top of most of the episodes, is not to nitpick the science. Yeah. I know there are going to be tons of discussions online of people going through and saying, all right, this dinosaur's foot looked weird and this... The way that this dinosaur walked seemed a little bit like it doesn't make sense. All the really nitty gritty nitpicky stuff or this little tiny thing, you know, bugged me. That is not typically what we do in silver screen science. A, because other people are doing that. That's yes. fine. And B, because that's not the fun part for us. Yeah, We, that's, we like the broader view, science and pop culture. That, that's the much more simplified way to critique it because it's just going through and factually picking it apart. But we also acknowledge that nitpicking stuff is fun. So at the end of every Silver Screen Science episode, we allot ourselves a single each mini rant, which is our opportunity to pick one thing that doesn't matter (laughs) that bothered us a bunch. Will, what is your mini rant about prehistoric planet my mini rant has to do with the ammonites now we already talked about them glowing uh which there's whole conversations to be had there Mm -hmm. uh and that is a legitimate conversation to be had on how they're represented but specifically one scene with the ammonites that's reused in all the intros is one of them swimming away and umbrellaing its arms like a jellyfish to swim away which octopus and squid are shown doing all the time in animation Mm-hmm. Shown doing that jellyfish swim. Right. If you do the jellyfish with your hand, mm-hmm. uh, you flap your, your fingers up and down like a jellyfish might. Yeah. We'll see them. They show them doing that with all their arms to swim away. 
And cephalopods don't do that. <laughs> like, no, they jet. They jet. They have a siphon, which <laughs> they use, they build up water pressure with and pump it out and push themselves through the water with jet propulsion. They definitely will open their arms and, and redirect and move, but they're not pumping like a jellyfish. Mm -hmm. That's not how they swim. <laughs> and it's in the intro. It's in the but intro. Every episode of this, you see that, that second and a half long clip of the ammonite pumping its arms like that and maybe it was meant to be like a no that's them displaying the glowing or something that they're waving the arms right but if they do it twice and it moves backwards each time it does it and, and it does definitely looks like it is <laughs> doing the jellyfish thing and it's like you already know that every single cartoon ever has had that problem <laughs> <laughs> because if you just show an octopus through the water, people won't know how it's doing that. So you have to show it swimming with its arms on a cartoon. Yeah. Another note towards the representation in scientists. All of the scientists we see in this documentary are vertebrate specialists. Yes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they had a consultant for invertebrates and I'm sure the ammonites are fantastic. Yep. <laughs> My mini rant has to do with language, especially since we're talking about education and, and communication of, of science. In one of the episodes, uh, there is a scene with therizinosaurs that are trying to get a beehive. Yep. And they're going up to the beehive, and then the bees are doing this little wiggle across the beehive, and it creates this wave of bee motion that goes across the hive. Which we see in modern day, like, rainforest bees that don't make a enclosed hive. Right. And just cover it with their bodies. And David Attenborough says, the bees do a Mexican wave to shoo away the predator and i was like what oh what <laughs> oh now so for some background that's the term in the uk apparently so when you go to a sport and you're in the stadium uh I, i'm sure our listeners have seen where they do the wave yeah. here in the u.s we call it the wave and it's just everybody stands up and wait, puts their arms up in the air like you're on a roller coaster. And, and, and you, you sit right back down. Past that standing and sitting around the stadium. Yeah, and it goes around the stadium. Then you wait for it to come to you. And then you stand up with everybody else. And then it goes. That's, that's the only part I like of sports. Though, yeah, that's what, <laughs> the wave is actually pretty cool. It's very cool. That's a cool. Like, there, there we are. There's the hive mind. Yep. Though when I was we little, do it. I went to a sports game and it went too many times. And I was like, do I have to get up? Again? That's true. Uh, no, I had the same thought. <laughs> So that's the wave. But in the UK, they call it the Mexican wave, apparently, mm -hmm. because it was popularized at, I think, a soccer, some some big soccer match. Yes. In Mexico. But I didn't know that. And we were talking about immersion. My immersion was shattered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because first I said, what? And then I said, Mexico doesn't exist in the late Cretaceous. And then I also was like, is David Attenborough being racist? Yeah. Because I didn't know the term. And it's, not, you know, it's it. this is an event that happened in Mexico. But I, that was a very odd, <laughs> that was a very odd term to use. Well, without any background as to what he's referring to, <laughs> just saying that a Mexican wave, it's like, I typically here in our country, at least, whenever you preface a <laughs> statement with, with a nationality. With, that, yeah, usually you're not being very polite yeah there's usually a negative <laughs> history to that but also you didn't have to, you could have just said a wave yeah you could have just described what they were doing it's on the screen <laughs> yes the bees move in a wave-like pattern to ward off the the predators yeah. that's you didn't have to drag mexico into this <laughs> <laughs> it was very jarring i that uh, it took me out of the experience <laughs> rather sharply <laughs> Enough so that we were looking up what it was while the documentary was still going. Yeah, no, I I pull, I went, what? Hang on, there is an Asaurus, and I looked it up. That was utterly bizarre. I'm sure all of our UK listeners are, are laughing at us. Oh, probably. <laughs> and hey, that's part of our marketability. That's our charm. We are extremely funny. <laughs> listeners, we hope that you have enjoyed... This discussion, we this is the first time we've ever done a documentary for Silver Screen Science. Usually we're doing movies. If people like this, maybe we'll do more documentaries. So let uh, us know it, what you think. This has got us thinking a lot about Walking with Dinosaurs. A bit. A bit which is funny because I don't actually remember Walking with Dinosaurs. Hardly at all. I watched it 
when I was younger, but it is all gone from my brain. I, I, that's one where it's like, I couldn't necessarily give you the play by play right now, but I'll remember every scene as it's happening. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure I'll, it'll all come back to me if we watch it. So maybe we'll do more uh, documentaries like this. Like we said, let us know what your thoughts are on Prehistoric Planet. There's been lots of discussion in the Discord, lots of discussions on social media. Reach out and chat with us. Let us know if you have any mini rants. And let us know what your favorite parts were. Have you been dancing like Carno Taurus uh, <laughs> alone in your home? Or perhaps to your significant other? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Also, it is uh, important to note, later this month we will release another Silver Screen Science episode about Jurassic World Dominion, which we will probably have significantly fewer kind things to say about. And a, and a decent number more criticisms, I expect. Probably. Perhaps. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. I, you know, Maybe I'm, they'll surprise us. I'm open to being wrong. Maybe it'll <laughs> open and David Attenborough's voice will sound out <laughs> and we'll go, all right, okay, not too bad. For the science of this movie, go to the Universal Studios website. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Also, uh, the last Silver Screen Science episode, if you haven't listened to our Jurassic World Dominion prologue discussion, it, the short version is Prehistoric Planet was everything that that should have been. Yes. Yep. Uh, but go check that out. And if you are on Patreon, we release a more thoughts episode about Prehistoric Planet, and it'll just be us talking about some more of our personal thoughts about the documentary. And also, just one more thing just to mention at the end, it is Croc Month! Woo! All uh, June, we are doing all sorts of croc-related stuff. By the time this comes out, we will have already released a bunch of cool social media posts. We will all already have cool stuff going on in the Discord. And we've also got some bonus episodes planned for June and July Yee. this year. So check out all the stuff one more time down in the episode description. We've got links to all the cool ways that you can participate in what we're doing. <gasps> I think that's enough talking for today that's not true we're gonna we're gonna record more thoughts yes. for patreon but that's enough talking for this particular that's recording. enough listening for all of you <laughs> that's enough for your ears uh thank you so much <laughs> please go listening. rest them listen to some like babbling brooks <laughs> and like whale noise <laughs> uh quick everybody do the wave <laughs> bye everybody bye Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.